Hey guys, Corey Allen here, of course, with the Overton Report, and I am joined by a uh, candidate for Charleston County Sheriff in the Republican primary runoff, Carl Ritchie. Uh, he's actually, you you were the uh, chief of police for Mount Pleasant for a long time. Is that right? Yes, sir, I was. Awesome. So so how are you doing today, man? Let's. Man, I'm, I'm doing great, and I really am glad if we had the time for us to finally connect. So much going on on uh, well, this campaign trail, so it's nice to get together. The primaries, primaries are crazy, man. And, you know, I've learned it's, that. <laughs> it's like a blood sport, really. Could be. Oh, man. So, um, so yeah, you know, th this is just, I, I wanted to give you uh, and your, your opponent in the runoff uh, an opportunity to kind of speak to the voters, the people who are going to be voting in this runoff, <clears throat> and eventually the people who are going to be um, electing the next sheriff to kind of make your case. Tell people who you are, what you're about, and uh, and and what you think you can bring to the to the sheriff's office in Charleston, because uh, something needs to be brought there. If if, if I'm being frank, um, so why don't we start with tell us how you got involved in law enforcement? Sure, um, my life, actually, my law enforcement um, journey started back in 1984 when I joined the United States Air Force. Um, I became a member of the security police. Uh, served four years active duty, uh, both in Montana, then again overseas in Germany. Um, got out after serving from honorably after serving four years in the Air Force active duty and went to work for North Charleston Police Department. Um, had the opportunity okay. to work for them um, in 88. And then in um, 1989, just before Hurricane Hugo, um, I was offered a job with a little bit more money. So I took it with Mount Pleasant. Where okay. I the last 32 of my 33 years of civilian law enforcement um, with the town of Mount Pleasant. Just have always had a desire and a heart to serve and protect. It's just, I guess it's in my DNA. I, I want to make sure that communities have a safe place to live and that they, they have the highest quality of life. And that, a lot of that starts with good, sound public safety. And, and this is something I've always wanted to do and always had a passion for. Absolutely. So you started, uh, you, you did your first year in civilian policing in, in North Charleston. That was pretty, pretty soon after North Charleston became a city, wasn't it? Oh, no, I, I think it became the city back in the 70s. And the, yeah, 76. So it was about 10, 10 yeah, years so later. That, that was quite, quite, a, quite a bit after. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. No, um, no back then. <laughs> that's true. You know, it all runs together. I was born in 87. So you oh, were, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> And I've got gray hair, so Oof. Yep. anyway, um, so you spent 32, you said 32 out of 33 years in Mount Pleasant. I you, did. And you started as uh, just a, a beat cop, a deputy? Yeah, or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I started as a sleep, sleep patrolman, they call it, with, with no rank. Um, you know, had the opportunity to come to a uh, a small agency at the time, uh, all considering true, yeah. with, uh, I think there was 30 of us when we started, and Snee Farm was far north as you went. And I was just very fortunate to be there because I had a lot of great mentors that, that were above me that really encouraged me to continue get my training, my education. Uh, one of the former chiefs, Tommy Sexton, really pushed education. And, you know, I made sure I've actually uh, continued on and actually earned my master's in criminal justice. And I have to I have to credit him for staying on me and saying, you want to get promoted in this agency. You got you got to get your education. So very fortunate. Um, I had the opportunity to be a first line supervisor, you know, work, work as a sergeant with a, with the uh, department okay. that was growing, made lieutenant, captain, command staff. So when I made captain for executive command and executive leadership, I probably spent half of my career in executive leadership of some time, captain and above, uh, to where I finally had the opportunity to um, compete for the chief of police position um, after the chief before me, Chief Harry Sewell, had to decide to retire and was actually appointed to uh, chief of police in 2013. And I served till 2021. I'm very proud of my accomplishments with the town, a town that by the way, grew to over hundred thousand people or close to it and 166 police officers. So I was a police chief of the fourth largest municipality in the state of South Carolina. Okay. Well, that's, that's an interesting point. It, it grew from a, a tiny 30, 30 officer, 30 officers when you got there and you you kind of watch well not only did you watch Mount Pleasant grow into like you said the fourth largest municipality in the state but you watched the entire area grow and yes, 
so with that, did you obviously with population growth, with development comes different types of criminal activity, different types of 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 crime and public safety issues. Uh, what's the biggest difference that you see between today and kind of the first maybe five or six years when you began? Well, you know, I, not a lot of difference, I, I would say, in, in how we policed, um, at least for the, the crime prevention part of it. Obviously, technology and everything's changed over the years. We've had to keep okay. up with. But I think it's always been um, that community policing aspect that Mount Pleasant had adopted a long time ago in proactive policing, where we engaged our citizens, no matter if you're living in the multi-million dollar home or you were in you know, our project area, we made sure that we engaged with our with our residents that we made sure they knew who their police officers were, that they we knew what their issues were and their quality of life concerns and crime concerns. And with that type of partnership, they would communicate with us, we could communicate with them to help crime um, remain low. You know, and, and we understood that, you know, as time went along, crime, the opportunities could increase. You got more area that you can break into, more cars to break into. Oh, that's true. So we made sure we focused on that and 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 continue to um to put in the proactive policing to where, at least under my leadership, we were named one of the safest cities in America year after year after year. And I'll tell you, it had a lot to do with the fine men and women who were out there policing every day and our community relations relationships who were willing to talk to us and actually to kind of sometimes let us know who was doing the crime, quite frankly, because they cared about their communities too, which is very important. You don't, you don't see that in every community. No. But at least ours, we, had, we had gained their trust and you know they had gained our trust, and we gained their trust. So I think that, that made that made a big deal. Obviously, watching the drugs change over the years, the crack cocaine. I mean, I was a narcotic sergeant back then. It was just destroying people, destroying families. Yeah, it, it was horrible. And then I'm watching, you know, obviously the heroin, then the fentanyl issue that's going on right now. And you know, I, I as both a narcotic sergeant and all through the ranks, lieutenant, captain, finally chief, really had to pay attention to what was going on and realize that we can't always police our way or arrest our way out of these situations. That's why I really had strong relationships with a lot of our private community partners. And I, I mentioned one in particular, Wake Up Carolina, and Nancy Shipman, who we sat down if she lost her son to an opioid um, oh, poison. Okay. He died. And she and I sat in my office, um, gosh, 2016, I believe it was, and we talked about what can we do. And, you know, at that point, we started getting our officers trained in Narcan, training our citizens and anybody that wanted the Narcan. We had the first take back box so you could bring your, your drugs and drop them off at our police department and we would destroy them for you, recognizing that. Without you know, like without arresting the person who right. would bring them in. Yeah. That okay. is right. and, what, yeah. and what we found out a lot of times um, we would respond to these overdoses mm -hmm. or poisonings. Now, if a fentanyl is a poisoning, not even yeah. an overdose with how small it is. Well, we would respond, and the traditional response was respond, EMS would transport, we'd probably do a search warrant or arrest people that were still there, and that would scare them to call us, and we, we were That's losing true. people. They, they were dying because they were too afraid to call. So we had to change that mindset to where we would respond, and we would have to let them know we're here to help you and to help the person that had overdosed had been poisoned. And then we followed up with them by going, having my victim advocates go to the hospital, meet family do follow-ups, aftercare. And I'm telling you, we, we saw a big drop in the in the overdoses of poisonings. I know the program has continued, even though I, I had retired. Um, we have great people that are in place that continue the program, um, continue to work the program. And I understand just recently, they spoke at a big conference for Mount Pleasant. You're showing a 30% reduction in the overdoses of poisonings reduction. where other states are still showing the increase. So I'm very proud of that. Type of partnership, and you got to have that mindset. You can't have that, you know, twenty-five year old mindset where, you know, you overdose and died. That's your problem. Yeah, you know, it's our problem. It's a community problem, and if you don't think it affects everybody, at least somebody knows somebody, they do. So that's very important to me. Well, that you know, that's that's very true. You said that that's Wake Up Carolina. Is that the, that's is. okay? I'm going to look Wake into that Carolina, because they 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 are based right out of Mount Pleasant. They do incredible incredible work right and I, I would encourage you maybe have her on your show one day i, I think i might i mean you know uh, mo mm -hmm. most of the people that listen and watch our show know that i'm actually a recovered opiate addict and i was very lucky to survive uh after everything that happened it's 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 not 
you know, it, it's it's not something that people do once they get hooked. It's not something that they do to get high. It's something that they it, it's th there's a, a very big mental and physical component there that I think mm -hmm. that we're just now just now in society. I think people are starting to understand that, you know, th there's there's more to it than just like you said, arresting your way out of the problem. It's it's a very, very complex issue, especially when it comes to opiates, because so many people, so many people were placed on opiates by people they trusted in in in, in the aspect of a physician, you know? Um, yeah, you're, you're which right crazy. Crazy. And, and so, I you, so, so something I learned just real quick, if you sure. don't mind, um, is... And, and, and thank you for sharing your story and, and, and congratulations, by the way. I, I quickly learned that um, you never recover. You're always in recovery. It's, it's an everyday thing that you have to, to wake up and deal with. So I, I just say, I, I say that to say congratulations and keep doing it every day, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, it does change, you know, it changes from week one, year one, year two, year three. Uh, but you're right. You know, it is there. There is always, you know, kind of a shadow there that you kind of have to watch out for. Um, it's yeah, it's a very interesting concept. So so, you know, I, I was going to ask a question about the difference between sheriffs and chiefs. But before we do that, I want to um, I kind of want to ask. Do you have a plan uh, or, or or what can the sheriff do when it comes to furthering that when it comes to because we know that that drug addiction leads to a lot of opportunistic crimes and it leads to a lot of people who otherwise would not commit crime at all to to go into that that world in order to get you know get their high so is there anything that the sheriff's office can really do to to better than what they're doing now in, in uh, your mind? Yeah, I, I do think so. And I'm just going to start with, um, you know, the elephant in the room, if, if you will. Um, when the incumbent, the, the current sheriff, took over, she immediately abolished ICE, immediately. That's right. So 11 ICE agents gone. And a lot of the drugs, we all know it, are coming through the border. We, we know that. Almost um, all. And, and, and you put off for, for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something we have to do day one with the sheriff's office, reestablish that relationship work with all of our federal and state partners. And, and like I just told you, our, our civilian partners who are out there um, fighting every day to, to keep um, to keep people from um, dying from this addiction. And so that, that needs to be reestablished and will be. When, when I think about the sheriff's office, I think about the rural unincorporated areas, quite frankly. Um, the municipalities, Mount Pleasant, North Charleston, Charleston City, um, they have really good programs working with Wake Up Carolina. And um, I'm not sure that relationship is as strong with the sheriff's office as it could be where, where we should be sharing data with them, understanding where where the um, overdoses are occurring. That way we can have an idea of what where we should be concentrating. But quite frankly, when the unincorporated out, um, areas, and we can even talk about the crime on that, are not mm -hmm. getting services they need. You are go out towards Edisto, go back towards McClellanville, Hollywood, where folks are just as prone to um, to be become addicted to the opioids or the fentanyl crisis, and they don't have that immediate um, place to go. And and I want to make sure all the deputies are are trained and make sure they're they're current on, on the Narcan. So if they do arrive on or to a poisoning, they can at least save the life, and then we can start working from there. But we need to get right. out to these, these um we need to get out to these more rural communities have community meetings, let them know the resources are available. Let them know that we are here to help them not arrest our way out of this problem. And then th those folks like you're talking about are now, um, they're addicted and they're having to steal to support mm -hmm. themselves or support their habit. We can help work through that, hopefully get them into recovery, like people like you who are who, who are success. I'm, I'm looking right. at one right now. Let them know there's a way out of this and they're, they're in it and help them get the help the help they need to to start a recovery and stay in recovery and give them other other alternatives than breaking in and stealing. But we we got to get out to these um, unserviced areas and let them know we're here for them. And that's that's an interesting uh, an interesting point. So 
uh, we'll, we'll talk about that further a, li a little bit later, but I want to, I want to talk a little bit about, you, you were appointed chief, you were hired chief and in, in the role of a chief, basically your boss is the elected mayor in that, in that scenario, right? Well, with Town of Mount Pleasant, we're a, we're a strong council, weak mayor. So actually, that's true. That's, 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 that's true. actually, I, I, I report directly to the town administrator. Okay. The town administrator in Mount Pleasant. So either, either way. So, so yeah, in Mount Pleasant at that, it's that way in places with a strong mayor, they, uh, you know, Charleston, it was direct is direct to the mayor, things like that. Um, as far as a sheriff goes there, you're it. You are, you are the top dog. You are the decision maker. There's nobody you have to necessarily run things by in order to begin implementing them. Right. Um, so I guess, I guess my question to you is, would you, would you as a sheriff kind of run things a little bit differently than, than the civilian council would have had you run, had, had you run things or were you able to have basic autonomy when you were the chief and, and do you understand what, I, what I'm trying to ask? <laughs> I, I, I absolutely do. And, and I, I greatly appreciate the question. Um, th there are several parts of that. Well, first and foremost, I work for you. I work for the citizens of Charleston County, you know, who, who voted me in and who didn't vote me in, quite frankly. But I work for the people. I do not work for county council or county administrator. I answer to you. And no, I don't have to run things by you, but I certainly want to get... Um, have those partnerships with our with our, our county. It's like I talked about a minute ago, being out there in these um, rural areas, talking to our mayors, talking to you know our, our different community leaders, and asking what they need. What do you want? And if it's within my power to do it, I'm going to do it. So, um, fortunately for me, as a police chief, um, I had gained the respect of not only my uh, town administrator, um, but the mayor and council. And, and you know, mm -hmm. they still have some input, obviously, they're elected sure. officials. Yeah. I would never disrespect them. I'd have to answer to them. But they recognized they had a chief who had the training, the education, the background, the community support to successfully do my job. And quite, and I'll tell you, just during the pandemic, I think that's when it shined the most. There's a lot of stuff going on, Corey, back then. You know that with um, sure a lot did. of infringements on rights, quite frankly. Uh, sure. from, from mask ordinances to closing down businesses to mandating vaccines. And, and let me be upfront. I'm not anti any of that. I want people to make their informed decisions and do what's right for them and their families. So sure. I, I will tell you, um, dur during <laughs> the ever, ever changing pandemic laws that came out or, or, or situations, you know, I, I was asked about enforcing the mask and I would not. I said, you know, that is, that's a civil ordinance, first of all. And my men and women had way more to do in protecting the community, especially with people not getting to go to work, not being able to be able to be in their businesses. We had to protect you. And, you know, if I got asked what, or told there's a business running behind the closed doors, good for them. They're trying to feed their families. So I I, I wouldn't do that. And, you know, okay. I think after taking that stand and there's several news conferences where I made that um, statement that, do what's right for you and your family. I encourage you to get the information. And as you recall, when several um, municipalities, including North Charleston, I believe Charleston County, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, they mandated all employees to be vaccinated mm -hmm. everywhere. And the town administrator, mayor, they all talked to me and said, what do you think? Should we do that? I said, absolutely not. I said, we have got, I said, let's encourage it. Let's give them all the science behind it. Let them make the decision. Now, when I say encourage it, just let them know we have it available to you if you want it, but we are not going to take your job from you. And you, you saw what happened in North Charleston, 30 plus officers, I think, resigned. That's right. It, it, they, they did they it to the fire out. department. There were lawsuits. It, it, cost the, it cost the city a lot of money. And, and um, they were quickly finding out a lot of it didn't work. Quite, no, quite, not, none of it. Yeah, absolutely. Quite frankly. So, to say, yeah, I, I I did have the power to do my job. And I think I got asked at a council meeting one time when they were trying to pass different ordinances during the pandemic. You know, Chief, what, what do you need to do your job? I said, I have all the authority I need. And I knew I did. I have a constitution that backs me, first of all. So I knew good and well, as long as I was following the letter of the law and the spirit 
of, of our constitution, we, we were going to be just fine, you know, and unless some other information come out, what came out, we didn't know about, we were right on track right. and we had protected our town with, with no problem whatsoever. Um, I don't know if you're asking me the difference, you know, between chief and sheriff. I don't know if you want me to jump into that. Yeah. So obviously the sheriff is over all of Charleston County, all 1300 plus square miles. Mm -hmm. we, we are the top law enforcement, but the chiefs do not answer to this. Let's make sure everybody understands that the chiefs have their um, municipalities that they're all responsible for and do a pretty good job. You know, I, I have great relationships with, well, obviously the former chiefs when I was chief, <laughs> and now I have great, I still have great relationships with Chief Walker, Chief Arnold, who I helped get in the position at North Charleston. I mean, I'm sorry, with Mount Pleasant that I worked with over 25 years. And obviously Chief Gomes, um, that's currently at North Charleston. I know they're working on looking at a, a new chief, but we have those strong relationships. And I think it's important for the sheriff's office to be in a support role for whatever those agencies need. Because a lot of times municipalities can't afford some of the um, the forensic technology or okay or or, or the um the tactical type things the, or the boats you know the um the aircraft where we have a bigger budget where we can actually purchase and we can fund those opportunities and staff those opportunities where when they need it we can work with them and give them the support they need it's all charleston county's tax dollars regardless so we should all be working together and that's something that's we valid. can do. And, and and I think that's we had a good relationship before with Sheriff Cannon. Um where, where if we if I if I call Sheriff Cannon and I needed something when I was chief, he we got it. And by the way, Sheriff Cannon and I, you know, for over 30 years when he was at sheriff's office, he and I talked often. He mentored me, especially when I became chief. We could really talk a lot, being in that top cop um, position. And for a lot of the, a lot of folks that know, he was my commander in the um, Air Force Reserves. We were both OSI agents. Oh, is that right? So a lot of history. The man knows me. That's yeah. why he endorsed me. But anyway, that's right. Yeah. So, so as uh, what what I've heard, and you know, you can tell me if if you experience okay. any of this. But what I heard regarding uh, Graziano, the the Democrat elected sheriff yeah. at the moment, um, was that when she took charge, you you, you referred to it earlier. Uh, she she removed ICE from the entire. She said we will no longer work with them. They're out of the jails, you know. Uh, but but beyond that, she kind of cut a lot of communication between the chiefs. And you just you were just speaking about the fact that the county uh, sheriff's department is is kind of there to provide um, a, a role of support to the municipalities. Uh, now. I saw some reports on that. Is that something that, that you experienced? Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, no. you question. oh, my gosh. Day one. So we all get up the next morning and we see Sheriff Cannon's lost. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she's a new sheriff. You know, I, Sheriff, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Chief, Chief Reynolds and Chief Burgess. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to each other, we all three called her. But I called her immediately that morning. I said, hey, congratulations. Don't know you that well want to get to know you. We are here. I said, I'm here to support you and the Charleston County Sheriff's Office in any way I can. We are the we are the big four agencies in the low country. We've got to work together. And I want to make sure that you're able to succeed, succeed. I've talked to the other chiefs. She never once reached out to all that decades of institutional knowledge we had where we could have been a help. Just didn't want it. I, I don't know why she didn't want it. So be it. I have since talked to chiefs now mm -hmm. who have had that same complaint where she will not work with them. They've they've had people they want to bring to the jail that they need to go off the streets and she refuses to take them. They've actually had to take prisoners walk to the upstate and work with other jails to get them housed. Really? And she completely she's completely cut off um a lot of a lot of the communication um with, with our chiefs. So it's 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 lacking. Okay. It's obvious. Guys, we're we're a big county. We cannot do it alone. We've got to we got to be able to work together, and be able to have a force multiplier and, and bring all of our assets together to successfully um, protect Charleston County and its residents. I mean, that's okay. I, I'm glad that you can confirm that that was that was all true. That's extremely really? concerning to me. Um, with so so, what was it that you saw that made you decide you needed to run for sheriff? 
you know, I I think as what what, you, what we just talked about the um the the, the failures to communicate. I mean, mm. firsthand as police chief, you know, I saw that you know, um for for at least the whole time that that I was in, she came in with twenty twenty, and I'm now retired in twenty one. Um, so I I witnessed it firsthand. I witnessed good deputies, good command staff resigning because they were not getting the empowerment. They needed, we're not getting the support they needed to do their jobs. I'm just hearing from so many that I said, we can't do our jobs anymore. The, the, the lack of leadership is terrible. And I had so many reach out to me, Chief, we really wish you'd come back in the law enforcement. Will, will you come back? And we, we, we'd work for you and come back to work for you. And I, I still get those phone calls now. They're waiting to see what happens, whether or not they'll come back to work. And we have a lot of great folks that are ready to step up and, um, and, and do the job. Where I'm from here, th- th- this is my home. Right. I am born and raised in Charleston County, Johns Island native. My mother, 85. I didn't realize old, that. My, that's right. My mother, 85, is still on the island with all of my family and friends. They deserve, and they live in these unincorporated areas, by the way. Yeah, we're from Hollywood. That's where my family's from. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, what I'm talking about, they deserve to have good law enforcement responses, not a 30 or 45 minute response time because you've got so few deputies on the road. You've got to run from one end of the county to the other to, to get there. And I can talk more about that. That even when, you know, I was chief of Mount Pleasant, how we were running calls in McClellanville to back them up, gladly to back them up. Mm-hmm. So um, that reason, you know, um, our schools, you know, the schools to me are so important. Safety where SROs have been pulled out of schools, where yeah. they're doing roving, roving um, um, security. It, it doesn't work. You know, when I was police chief, we we had every school covered, middle and high school, with the SROs. And after the last um, last incident, I can't remember if it was Sandy Hook or which one it was. Um, I believe it was Sandy Hook, but where the last the tragedy in our school, I went back to because that was the elementary school, by the way, that was hit there. Mm-hmm. I went back to my council. I said I need thirteen more SROs for the elementary that. schools, and they did. They they that's the kind of relationship I have with my council. They said, yes, sir, chief, I got him. We have every single school covered in Mount Pleasant. If we have an SRO who goes out sick, the sergeant on duty's responsibility is to cover that school. I cannot afford to be 30 minutes away from an incident because it's over in, in less than probably three or four. That's right. gets to school. So our schools are so important to me. You know, the, these, these rural areas like you live in are so important to me. I want deputies who are assigned there that stay in that area. I want you to know who your deputy is. I want them to know you. So, Community yeah, policing well, that well, goes back to that. that, sir. That goes back to community policing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and community policing is not just a municipal thing. It can be countywide and be successful, and you know they they can they can successfully do their jobs by doing that. So, just having a servant heart, want to do it, prayerfully thought about it, have a long discussion with my wife because, um, yeah, I bet. And, we, and we and we did because you know she. You know, she she knew what, what a toll that it took on me my, my last couple of years, and um, you know, with, with all that was going on in this world. And I felt like I handled it pretty doggone well for all considering that went on. Um, being able to protect our town, to be able to to navigate you know, I mean, storms. I mean, you gotta remember, I was the chief for a couple of months when ice again happened, when the ice missiles falling from the bridge through the windshields. Oh, Do you remember that? I, I vaguely remember oh, that. Yeah. So my my family the bridge, talked about the bridge down because we had ice things falling up through cars. <laughs> you know, I had had the I had the five twenty six bridge fail, where, where oh, we had man. to stop all traffic. You know, I've had hurricanes. Mm. Deal, deal with the uh, civil unrest and pandemic. So, when 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 you ask a candidate what would you do, that's all well and good. But you can ask me what have I done, and you'll see exactly what I have done. Been tested, handled it handle it professionally and we'll continue doing that. Absolutely. And now I have one more, one more question sure. uh, about the, the uh, Al Cannon detention center. Now, okay. since, since Graziano uh, has taken over, there've been numerous scandals uh, coming out of there. Some, uh, some deaths that have been questionable, highly questionable. Jamal Sutherland comes to mind. Um, and that, was followed it seemed by graziano kind of walling things off and trying to keep the public from really knowing what was going on and and doing certain things to kind of hide you know bury the lead 
will you do will you do that differently when things happen? <laughs> like yeah. there's been a lack of transparency all around with Graziano. Thank you. I was just gonna say that. First of all, I'm gonna be the face of the sheriff's office. I'm gonna be the one behind the podium talking about it, not sending my PIO out to talk for me. Yeah, it okay. the buck stops here. I'm responsible for that jail. And you're absolutely right. You know, that was one of my pledges that I made when I ran is to run a safe and secure jail. You know, they're down some hundred plus jail professionals. You've got great men and women working in there, trying to do their job with um with little support, little empowerment. And you know, I, I had a I've had several spouses actually saw me just while I walking around the store one day and said, um, we we heard you're running. Thank you. We need you here. I'm scared for my husband or I'm scared for my wife, my spouse in the jail. And you're right, there's been at least nine deaths, if not more, mm -hmm. under her watch since she's been in there. There's a DOJ investigation, a bipartisan DOJ investigation. Let, let's, let's just make sure that's clear, where both from the Republican Democrat side have made a call to look into the jail um, because you, we definitely have problems. And um, I actually attended the uh, DOJ briefing uh, about a month or so ago. There was a, a briefing they held at the library downtown, public meeting for anybody, everybody to go to. I was the only candidate. Then, then there was four of us. The only one thought it was important enough to show up. So I want to hear hmm. exactly what they were doing, what was going on. They didn't share a whole lot because it's ongoing investigation. But I heard from families of former inmates what was going on. So, Corey, being understaffed, we've got to get that staffing up. we got to look at okay. why. First thing you do want to know is why can we not get more people in? Identify the problem. Or look keep at them. Well, well, let's listen. Yeah, absolutely. Let's look at yeah. exit interviews, and that's part of the re retention. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that, and, we, and we'll come up with ways to incentivize getting folks in there. Sure. Because right now, when when you've got so few detention officers and professionals in there, I find out um, many of our deaths have been um, health related, where an inmate's been sick or or fallen in some kind of uh, either mental health issue or medical mm -hmm. issue, and the staff doesn't find them until it's too late. Or if there is a suicide, they find them and it's too late. And not having the right amount of medical staff to at least do some from immediate first response type um, stabilization has got to change. Because right now you're going to call central desk, who's going to call EMS. And we know EMS is short. Those those men and women running calls every single day. They're, they're trying to, to prioritize which ones to go to. Mm -hmm. So, You've got to have people in here. And, and one of the things that I, I talked to um, another person that's, that's very well respected in the county, and he and I discussed um, the possibilities of actually having trained paramedics that work in the jail or our jailers, some of our jail professional who can get that cross training. Because right, everybody's got first aid, your basic, basic AED. Mm -hmm. But we'd like to see, I'd like to see, as well as the gentleman I was talking to, or get them to train the EMT and paramedic advanced life-saving. So at least when they come across it, they can do, do a little more than just AED or, or stabilizing or making a phone call. Mm -hmm. So we can get that person transported and, and, and get them um, saved. And we'll save a lot of money right now. The amount, the, the number of settlements is ridiculous. And the, money, and the payouts that, that we're making that aren't bringing these family members back. So we have to do that. We've got to look at the contract for the medical service at the jail. You know, I think they've gone through two different providers, as I understand it, since she's taken over. Oh, really? We, we, we got to look at that 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 request for quote, and then and you got to look at make sure is everything in there, or is the person who got the contract say, yeah, I'll do the minimum you're asking me to. Right. We, we got to make sure when that's executed, we have the most professional folks in there that can handle the job, and keep them um, these these folks. Um, safe because once we have them in jail, we're responsible for them. Period. I don't care why you're there or what reason you're in there. We're responsible. Yeah. The, the same with mental health issues that we that we find out are really happening in the jail. You're probably already dealing with it before you got there, but it may yeah. manifest itself for the first time when you get there, and it's an opportunity to maybe provide some type of mental health assistance or addiction assistance. So we will see you back in the jail again. Because but right now I'm hearing especially talking to a lot of our folks in the um, on the private mm -hmm. side where you'll, you'll get them to help in the jail. So if they're there for 30 days, six months, whatever it is, they're getting help. They're getting counseling. Um, they're getting what they need for addiction. Then when they get out, that's it. 
There's, there's yeah, no, that's it. There's no aftercare, no follow up, and I, I'm I'm already hearing the nation as well. That's our tax dollars, okay? But what what let, let's weigh it out. Give them the help; it costs a lot less, and then or, we will or have keep them in jail. jail. That's right, or keep them in jail, which costs costs exorbitant amounts of money. That's right, a ton of money to house you in jail and mm -hmm. feed you and care for you, where we can get you the help you need to get you started. So we don't see you back in that jail again. We don't want you back in there. You know, we I got to work <laughs> with our solicitor's office and our public defender. I had an opportunity to sit down with the public defender and have a, have a conversation with her recently. You know, if we've got nonviolent offenders in the jail, there's got to be a way to get those out of the jail so we can make sure the violent ones stay in jail. Right. And we have enough staffing to monitor them, but still have it where the nonviolent to understand your your waiting trial, your pending trial. So you're not guilty, and that's that's something I think a lot of people don't really yeah. understand. When you're arrested and you're in county jail, nine, you know, I, I would probably say what seventy percent, maybe seventy percent of the people in j in that jail are awaiting trial. Yep. You know that they're not yeah. guilty. They're not. You know the, that's the whole basis of our entire justice system is that they're not guilty; they're innocent until proven guilty, and they've yet to go to court. And so it's different than prison, and it's right. different than being convicted of a crime and being in jail for it. Like the, the, so, that's yeah, why yeah. I think a lot of people miss that nuance, and I think it's an important. Yeah, one. Yes, you're absolutely right. And and again, make more room for my violent criminals to stay in there. Let the nonviolent, and and we can look at what crimes those are. And make sure that we're monitoring them while they're out. But I want the I want the violent people to stay behind bars. I don't care how long they're waiting on the trial. I mean, I want the nonviolent folks off our streets. I want our communities protected. All too often, we see that violent criminal who's in jail gets a bond, and what do they do? They commit again another violent crime. That's our responsibility, quite frankly. And I, I think we can work with our solicitor, with our public defender, with folks, and we can we can do a better job at that. That's interesting. So, you know, this has been a really good conversation and I could honestly talk to you about this all day. Um, it's, you know, kind of, it's close to, it's close to my heart because I know, you know, I've been in the recovery community and I've seen, you know, I've seen the good and the bad of all of this. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, but the runoff is June 25th. Yes, sir. Now everyone, everyone out there should know. I just want to tell everybody, you don't have to have voted in the primary to vote in the runoff. The only people who are not allowed to vote in the runoff are people who voted in the Democrat primary. That's for, correct. For sir. anything. So, right. Yeah. And uh, it's you and it's uh, Greg Kitchens. Yes, sir. And uh, where can people go to to learn more about you, your platform, you know, what your what your things, what your goals are? Sure. You go to www.carlrichieforsheriff.com. You can see a lot about me on there. Uh, my phone number's on there. Uh, call okay. me. I'm happy to talk to anyone about it. Email me. Um, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm very accessible to our citizens, to our county, and um, which I'll continue to be when I'm sheriff. I'll always be accessible. I'll always be transparent. I'll always be upfront, and I want to provide that trusted and competent public safety leadership that the sheriff's office needs so badly. Well, you know, thank you so much for for coming on here and and talking to us. We really do appreciate it. Um, you know, good good luck. I know I know that sure. primaries can be can be rough, but uh, we we need we need a new sheriff and we need somebody who who knows what they're doing. That's for sure. Yes, sir. So. it's well worth it. It's well worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's that's Carl Ritchie, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. My name, of course, is Corey Allen, uh, and this has been the Overton Report.